I won't have to come quite as far back as last Sunday. Uh, I think the first pew that had anybody in it was this one. <clears throat> so I'll stop here. Uh, welcome to worship at Christ Lutheran Church of Hendricks, Minnesota. I have a question to ask, uh, probably the older ones of you. Any of you remember a guy by the name of Bruce Woshi? Yeah. Huh? A week ago tomorrow night, I told Bruce that I'd been here. He says, well, I lived there for 12 years. And uh, he uh, has good fond memories of his times that he spent in Hendricks. So. He was chairman of... Uh, Sinai Lutheran Church at the time they recruited me to fill in for a couple of months that ended up being two and a half years uh, so I don't know if I trust him anymore but uh, that's the way that goes but welcome to worship on this fifth Sunday after Pentecost I'm not sure there are there's one announcement that needs to be made and uh, And uh, next Sunday, on the 4th, you're gathering in the park, I understand, for uh, worship at the same time, 9 o'clock, in the park. Are there other announcements that need to be made? Well, if not, I direct your attention to page 94 in the front of the hymnal. Uh, the brief order for confession and forgiveness and I invite you to stand as you are able. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ has given was given to die for us and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
we pray together the prayer of the day that you find printed in your worship folder. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, we implore you to hear the prayers of your people. Be our strong defense against all harm and danger, that we may live and grow in faith and hope through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Morning. The first lesson this morning is from Lamentations 3. And we've got verses 22 to 33. And it's on page 937 in the Old Testament. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says the soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke in youth, to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, to put one's mouth to the dust. There may yet be hope to give one's cheek to the smiter and be filled with insults. For the Lord will not reject forever Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The psalm for today is Psalm 30, found on page 6 of the Old Testament. And this psalm deals with thanksgiving for recovery from grave illness. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol, Restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you had established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O oh Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O oh Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. And the second lesson today is from 2 Corinthians. Chapter 8, verses 7 to 15, and it's found on page 223 in the New Testament. It 
This scripture deals with the encouragement to be generous. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this manner I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something, now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of fair balance between your physical abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. I invite you to stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark Chapter 5. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so she may be made well and live. So he, Jesus, went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had a suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians, had spent all she had, and she was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, If I touch his clothes, I will be made well. And immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed from her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone out from him, Jesus turned around about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear. Only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. 
When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside, took the, father, the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in to where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel of our Lord. I invite you to be seated. Let us pray. Living and loving God. Call us to come to you in every and all needs in our lives. Lead us to trust, to believe. Lead us to call to Jesus for help. Create within us a trust, a trust that allows that help to be at work in us. Show us your will, show us your way. Lead us to the truth about ourselves, about yourself, and especially about our Savior and Lord Jesus, the Christ. Use our thoughts, use our words, use what we say and do here now to do whatever you want with us and in us and through us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friends in Christ who are called to be saints, grace to you and peace from our living and loving God who is the creator and sustainer of all that exists, from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, and from the Holy Spirit who is at work in us and in the world. In these chapters 4 and 5 of what Mark wrote about the work and words of Jesus, he really kind of tells us just about everything we need to know about what Jesus the Christ can and will and wants to do in us, through us, and for us. Shows us lives of people that were dramatically changed because they met Jesus. Dramatically changed when Jesus met them as he traveled on the shores of the Sea of Galilee as he went back and forth between the Jewish side and the Gentile side of that sea, as he stood on the shores and talked and taught. Last Sunday we read and considered what happened when on the sea a storm arose and Jesus calmed the wind and the waves. When they reached the other side, when they got to the Gentile side of that Sea of Galilee, they met a man who was possessed by demons, which made him act like a person we would likely call a wild man, crazy man, possessed man. And Jesus freed him from that demon possession. Then they went across the sea again. Mark, and uh, what I just read took place 
when they reached across the sea. Mark, now he's back on the Jewish side. Mark doesn't tell us much about the makeup of that cloud, that crowd that had gathered on the seashore as Jesus and his closest followers came back from the other side of the sea. We can guess that they'd heard things about what had happened. They had become aware of something special going on with Jesus. They had probably heard about the stilling of the storm. They may have heard about the man being freed from his demon possessions. We can guess that they had seen and heard much and wanted to see and hear more about Jesus. Some were likely just curious. Wondered what might happen next. They come as spectators. They, they ended up wondering what on earth this might eventually mean in their lives. But one of, one of those in the crowd came with a clear and a very specific purpose. He wanted Jesus to heal his daughter. Jairus who came looking for Jesus, a leader in the synagogue of that community, came looking for Jesus, apparently a man of considerable power and influence. He would have been highly respected by others. He held a position of authority in his community. He was kind of a chief sort of person in the synagogue. His understanding of life would likely have been characterized by by such thoughts as, I've got to make the right decisions, we've got to make things work the right way, and if we do, and we don't let anything distract us from our tasks, life will be right, life will be good. And it may have gone that way for a long, long time for Jairus and the people of that community. And then it happened. His daughter became critically ill. And any of you who have had that happen know the feelings that go with that. Our second to the youngest son became critically ill about four years ago. He died almost a year and a half ago. When you get that news of a critical terminal illness, it hits you like nothing else can hit you. And we can imagine he tried everything. We can imagine that he would have consulted with every doctor he could found, find anywhere in that community and in the surrounding communities. He may have tried some home remedies. Perhaps he traveled to other places to seek healing. Nothing helped. The man who had probably thought that he had pretty good control over everything and anything that might ever happen in his life was faced with something about which he could do nothing. The result was despair. That happens kind of often. People who get along in life pretty well, they move along from day to day, they, they think what they can do, they get along better than most maybe for many days, for weeks, maybe even years, perhaps most of our lives. We might put on a pretty good show in this world, but life will finally be empty unless it is the living and loving God who guides and works and bless us our living. In every age and in every place, persons come to the point in their living where after doing what they consider to be the acceptable, the proper, the appropriate, but make all the right choices, they will wonder, what is it meant after all? Centuries earlier, the nation of Israel had discovered that, that not only for individuals, but for nations, that was true. 
After the living God had brought them out of Egypt, a life of slavery, through the Red Sea and through the wilderness, he'd cared for them, he'd fed them, he'd given them water in the wilderness. At Mount Sinai, he'd given them a vision of what life is meant to be. He had brought them to Canaan and richly blessed them in their new homeland. Israel at that time had begun to think that as a nation, finally, we are in charge of our own destiny. But when we read the biblical history of the message of the prophets in the Old Testament, it becomes clear that they had come to the point where they really thought they were in charge. They really thought they could do everything right by themselves. But the armies of Babylon defeated them the city of Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed, became a heap of rubble. They were taken captive and to a life of exile in Babylon. They were like a paraphrase of what we read in Psalm 30. This is a translation of that psalm, a piece of the translation of that psalm by Eugene Peterson in a, in a paraphrase called The Message. And he translated it this way. When things were going great, I crowed, I've got it made. I'm God's favorite, even the king of the mountain. Then you, O oh God, looked the other way. And I fell to pieces. Their situation was desperate. The people were overcome with a real and powerful grief. The people brooded in silence. They lived in despair. And some of that despair is portrayed very vividly in the Old Testament book of Lamentations, from which we read in our first reading for today. In that book, the prophet Jeremiah sets forth what is being experienced by the nation. That book has five chapters, just five chapters. Chapters one, two, and four are all organized in kind of the same way. In those chapters, and then there's a piece of chapter three that's the same. Organized, it can, each successive verse, and there are 22 verses in those chapters, each successive verse starts with a successive letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And so Jeremiah is stating what he might have called causes for our grief from A to Z, four times through. But in the middle of the third chapter, there's a little different kind of piece. Jeremiah, in that chapter, shared the message. We've heard it already. And in the midst of that promise, he said to the people, the steadfast love of God endures forever. God's mercies are new every day. Hope in the Lord. God will act. It was that kind of a promise that Jairus came to know as a personal truth in his life. However, his quest for that help was interrupted along the way while traveling through the crowd with Jairus. A very sick woman approached Jesus trying to be unnoticed. She'd led a miserable life. 12 years of hemorrhaging Twelve years, tried everything to get well. Such hemorrhaging would have led people to consider her to be unclean, to consider her to be unacceptable socially. And it appears that it was in a kind of a final desperation that she came and touched the robe of Jesus and was healed. She felt that power of Jesus at work in her life. Jesus felt power to go out of him. She was healed. 
throughout these, and while all that was happening, the message came from, to the house, from the house of Jairus that his daughter had actually died. Overhearing the message, Jesus said to Jairus, and this is probably the most important phrase in all those verses we read today. He said, do not fear, only believe. The house was filled with mourners who were expressing their true grief, family and friends. Around the door were others who were apparently professional mourners, paid to be there to weep and to cry and to show sorrow. Jesus, sought out by Jairus, came and said, she is not dead, but only sleeping. Mark tells us that the people laughed. People who think they're in control, people who think that they've kind of got it all figured out, will almost always laugh, inwardly or out loud, or at least will be very skeptical when they are told things that are not the way they think they are. Jesus puts them out of the house, took the little girl by the hand, said, little girl, get up. It seemed like an impossibility. Dead people don't get up. When you die, you're dead. But she did. So Mark, in all of this, in the Gospel according to St. Mark, in all of these chapters of what he wrote about the work and words of Jesus, told us that Jesus shows authority over the Sabbath. He healed on the Sabbath almost right away after he had been baptized and tempted and returned to life among the people. He has authority over the teaching of the scribes as he taught the truth in the synagogue. He showed authority over illness, authority over demons, authority over the forces and power of nature. And now the ultimate authority. He has authority over death. The meaning and message that Mark is trying to bring to the reader then and the reader now is he tells us about Jairus, Jesus brings life, hope, certainty. He said, don't be afraid, only believe. Jesus was saying, trust me. No matter what's going on, no matter what's happening, trust. Trust me. That was like saying, look, you came to ask my help. In your helplessness, you turned to me because you saw and hoped. Now go with me and see what happens. That's what gives life. Life that can never be taken away from us. Going with Jesus and seeing what happens. Many lives must have been changed that day. Clearly the lives of Jairus and his daughter and the woman with the hemorrhage healed that day. Some of the people in the crowds must have, must have come to a new understanding of Jesus they had questions about him, and now they're coming to understand in a new way that Jesus is more than usually meets the eye. At the very least, they would have gone from being merely curious spectators to wondering, what more? What more might Jesus mean in their lives? What Jesus did in the lives of the people that day on the sea, by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus still does. Whether our need is from a long-lasting illness and the discouragement that goes with it, 
or from an immediate threat of death or something happening to a loved one, no matter what happens, no matter what's going on, no matter how disastrous things seem to be, Jesus, Jesus is with us. If we've been curious spectators, Jesus can enter our lives and fill them with purpose and with direction. If we've only sort of wondered, you know, Jesus, nice, nice guy, only wondered, you know, what he might mean, we can come to know and believe in and live with him as our Savior and our Lord. From time to time during my years of teaching in confirmation classes and adult Bible studies and things like that, I've often asked the question, what is faith? Is it something I do? Or is it something I have? Or is it something that happens to me? Can a person have faith? Or is faith something that has me? In a sense, it's all true. But first and foremost, faith is something that takes hold of us. It's letting Jesus do his work in our lives. It's allowing Jesus to take you and everything that's true of you and me into his hands. It's praying each morning and throughout the day what was prayed by another person who was met by Jesus in time of need. He said, I believe, help my unbelief. Faith is not so much giving him our thoughts, our vision, or ourselves, or our actions. It's trusting. Trusting and going with Jesus as he comes into our lives to change our lives as he says to us, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Amen. May the peace of God that passes all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
I invite you to stand as you are able as we join our voices in confessing our faith, speaking together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was received by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated on the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, for those in need, and for all of God's creation. I will lead us in several short petitions, concluding with, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite you to respond. Hear our prayer. God of hope, the ministry of your church extends across borders, from nearby neighbors to far and distant countries. Accompany all those who labor eagerly in service of the gospel, that through your good news all might experience transformation in their lives. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the air we breathe, the water we drink, the land that provides our food. Guard all species of plants and animals from harsh changes in the climate and empower us to protect all you have made. Lord, in your mercy. Righteous God, we pray for nations and their leaders. Give them a spirit of compassion and steer them towards a fair distribution of resources that none among us would have too much or too little. Lord, in your mercy. God of healing, your touch has the power to make us whole. We pray for those suffering from physical and mental illness. Embrace those who are sick Surround them with your unwavering presence, Lord, in your mercy. We pray for this assembly and for all those gathered together in worship. Revive our spirits, renew our relationships, and rekindle our faith that we might experience resurrection in our life together. Lord, in your mercy. We give thanks for the faithful ancestors in every age whose lives have pointed us toward you. Envelop them in your love that we may be reunited, that we may be reunited with one another in the last days. Lord, in your mercy. We lift our prayers to you, God, trusting in your abiding grace. And we trust that you continue to hear as we pray the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with kindness and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Stay for coffee, <laughs> but when you go, go in peace and serve the Lord.